So, welcome. Today is, what, our fourth lesson, right? Mm -hmm. And it's called Where the Wild Things Are. After the book by Maurice Sendak. And uh, that is the best-selling children's book of all time. And I hope that you'll be able to tell me at the end of the lesson why we called it Where the Wild Things Are. But what we're going to be looking at today is what happens to us when we complain, or why do we complain? Why do we get angry with other people, and how to deal with that? So last time, if you remember, we looked at shifting perspectives. How do you take yourself out of yourself? You look at things a certain way, another person looks at things a different way. I actually remembered a story, I don't think I told it to you last week, that uh, there was a chassid by the name of Reb Yukusil Lepler. Did I tell you about the penny, the shiny coin? Yeah, so, for each person. Yeah, okay, so I did. Yeah. He says a shiny coin means different things to different oh, people, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. To a child, it's a, it's a toy, and to a poor person, it's a loaf of bread, and to a wealthy person, it's a chance to make another penny. Another, he's going to invest it and make more money. So we all look at the same world, but what we see depends upon who we are. And today we're going to take that theme a little bit further, which is the way I look at things is going to change my own internal reality. And I tend, all of us tend, to impose our perception on other people. So the first thing we're going to do is an exercise, and you don't have to write it. You don't have to speak it out. You do have to write it down, but you don't have to tell anyone what it is that you're feeling. And this is, this is the exercise. Have a look at exercise one. If right, do you want to read? Read, read out loud so that everyone can hear. Where the wild things are. Self-assessment. What pushes your buttons? Exercise one. Identify one... Identify one failing in others that you, are that you are sensitive to or as distasteful to the situation that presses your buttons and keeps coming up over and over again. The failing or situation you choose must be a repeated theme of yours and must be something that arouses anger and disgust in you. Now write it down detailing why you are so bothered by it. Okay, so you're going to have a couple of minutes to do this, but I just want to clarify. This is your exercise. You're going to write down something that it's got two features. A, it happens over and over again. It's not like, oh, you know, I was in, in the store and someone dropped a bottle of milk and it spilled all over my skirt and I got upset. Well, of course, you know, you were on your way to a JLI class and you wanted to look great. So that you might be, it's a one-time thing that you got upset about, right? No, this is something that repeats over and over again. The second thing is that it must arouse in you a feeling of anger or disgust or disdain. I really don't like that. It's not that you're saying, <clears throat> I'm not crazy about it, but you know, it doesn't bother me so much. It has to be something that makes you angry, that presses your buttons, and it has to be something that happens over and over again. It's a repeated theme in your life. Does anyone want to share what they have to say? Like when people use, like, the term, I'm lazy, as an excuse for not doing things. I do it all the time. What do you mean, as an excuse? It's like, it's like, so that's like, an admission, no? I don't get anything done because I'm lazy. I'm like, you're not lazy. Just don't say that. They say it Like you're fooling yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Or, lazy, say. So or what, what bothers you about it? Because then they're not going to get anything done, and it gets me, drives me so crazy. Just stop saying that, and maybe they'll get some stuff done. And why does it bother you so much that they're not going to get anything done? Because it bothers me when people are lazy. Because <laughs> <laughs> she's very she's hard so work. Hard. It bothers you when people are lazy, or people just use that as an excuse for them. People use that excuse, and when people, I don't care so much if people are lazy, but when people just limit themselves and like they, they can't do anything, it just drives me crazy. So it bothers you that people make themselves smaller than they are. Yeah, and they waste their time. Yeah. <laughs> and the other one, they're all like the same thing. And like when people sit around and don't take initiative, like if the milk spills on the floor and they don't clean it up, oh uh, like, yeah, they wait around and drive me insane. And I'm like, just hello, it fell, clean it. And even if maybe they're, they're thinking that about you. <laughs> no, let's say I'm busy. Look, can I give you an example? Happened today. We were putting away the groceries and a pot fell off the counter. 
And my little sister is like dawdling around. I'm like, I'm like putting away stuff in the fridge and I'm busy and she sees and she's like sitting there staring. And I'm like, this, I got so weird. And I'm like, pick up the thing, you know? And like, also my third thing I wrote is when people can't admit that they're wrong and they just like, they think that they're so right and they're so full of it and it drives me crazy. And I'm like, okay, just... Like, I'm right, you're wrong, admit it, right? But usually no one <laughs> there could be there could be certain things that are objective, but the truth is what Efrat is saying is quite accurate that most, most things in life are a matter of perspective. Right. She's not admitting that she's wrong because she doesn't feel that she's wrong. Yeah, but you could you you can acknowledge someone else's opinion. Okay, let's say I'll give you say, an example. Okay, we're talking about you're something right, too, right. Some people won't even like bother to talk it out. They'll just say like, forget it, forget it, right, and like walk away or no, let's just like we'll say you know, that Okay, that. wait a second. Uh, right. Chaimushka is going to give one more exa cool. example and then I want to hear what Esti had to say. Like for example, like let's say the oven shut off by mistake and like something was sitting in the oven for two hours and it just never got cooked, right? And I don't know, like random example, but like then the person is like, no, well you 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 shut off the oven, no, you shut off the oven, and it's like none of us shut off the oven, just get over yourself, you know? Maybe the oven wasn't turned on. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> well, why does it have to become a whole big argument so that everyone just agrees? I don't know. Also, that. Right. Okay, so there are a couple of things that irritate you, Esty. Well, when someone like if you ask someone to do a favor for you, and like they'll do it, but then they like they're like, and then they always bring it up. Like let's say when Let's like, call something a meter. Well, and then they say, you know, I did that for you. I went to the store for you, and I picked up your medicine, or like whatever. And they just keep bringing it up for the next like year. It's just really annoying. <laughs> you owe them so much, right? I know. I'm like, oh my god, you went a half a block from your house to go get me something. Like, you know how many favors I did for you? Don't like, hang I don't bring it over them up. Head. I don't like, oh, you should do this because I did it for you. Okay. You know? It's called so like, not the button. comma, but something else. Mm. Well, there's Natira, the but that's different. And grudge it's is Huh? No, it's, it's not like God just like, fine, I'll give you my pencil, but remember, because I gave you mine. Yeah, but it's that's different. Snack, if you give me yeah, snacks. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the opposite. You're doing two snacks. It's grudge. Okay, it. girls, but that, yeah, kind of what you're bringing up is the exact opposite of that, which is saying, I will keep on reminding you of what you did wrong, as opposed to what Esty's saying, which is, I'll keep on reminding you of how righteous I am, and right. I did so much for you. So I guess all of us could feel that you know, there are things that, that nudge us and bug us. And what we're going to be looking at today is this notion of criticism. Sometimes, uh, or judgment, sometimes it is appropriate to make a judgment. But really the only judgments are about what does Torah allow and what does it not allow. And I say vidui for my own sins. I don't confess another person's sins. You know, there's, there's this fridge magnet that says, what you think of me is none of my business. Meaning, really, I shouldn't be concerned with what other people are thinking of me. And at the same time, kind of the opposite of that is, it's not my business to make judgments about your life. If I see that you're doing something wrong according to Torah, well, then maybe I need to awaken my love and try and help you. So what we want to look at today... What? When you see something wrong with someone else, you should look at yourself. And look inside of yourself. And it's true. I mean, when you find a fault in someone else, you usually have it in you. Right. So that's what we're going to be looking at today, is what makes me angry and what moves me to action. So we're going to do a little exercise, and we'll come back to our opening exercise at the end of the lesson, but we're going to start with a particular exercise. Do you see num number two? Mm -hmm. There's a big circle over there. I want you to put the word sunflowers right in the center of that circle. And now, you're going to have about a minute to write as many associations as you can about sunflowers. What do you mean? Okay? Like the, Anything, like if you think of yellow or if mm -hmm. you think of sun, it doesn't matter what you think, but you must keep on going. And maybe one word will remind you of another word. Keep on going. That's your central word. And if you run out of space in your circle, then you go outside so of the go circle. From one word to the next? Not necessarily. It should try and bring it back to sunflowers. Outside the One circle thing, or inside? Is that you matter. may fill up the inside of the circle and need the space outside. Oh, we have outside, to bring okay? it from sunflower back oh. to sunflower? It should always be an association about sunflowers. Oh, the same. Cheery. Cheery. Growth. Growth. Right. It's not very general. It's personal. I am like, I could say it, but it... Okay. Good. Um... I went horseback riding and there was a field of sunflowers. Oh, good. I, so I horseback, horseback riding, right? 
Okay, good. What's back riding? Um, just a random. We have some flowers in the backyard, so we had next to it. Pepper plant. <laughs> so, sorry? We have pepper plant and sunflower. Oh, plant so sunflower, sunflowers and pepper plants. Great. Um, I did summer. Summer? Me, Mulo. 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 The country. The country. Garden. Garden. Farm. Farm. And I'm sure you had many other words, right? Yeah. Would you say in general the words are positive or more down in their mood? Positive. Positive, right? So what I'm going to show you now is two paintings that were painted by Van Gogh. Oh. And they are both of sunflowers. Now, the one over here... Is it here? Yeah, they oh, are. yeah you have them, but I, I put them in, in color over here. So this one is 12 or 30, I can't remember how many, it is sunflowers in a vase. Can you see it, Chaimoshka? Yes, I can. Right, and then this one was actually, um, it's a very different uh, a vase with five sunflowers. This was in Japan and it was destroyed during World War II, this painting. It doesn't exist any longer. And here you have, here you have the same person painting sunflowers, but the feeling of the sunflowers is very different, right? What's the mood in this sunflower? Happier. Happier. Light. Happier. Day. Light. Alive. Good day. Day. Alive. Something positive, right? How many of you would have words that you would associate with this? Huh? I also like this painting better. It's so evocative. Yeah, this is more... This is more uh, I like you could check in like a nice home. It's not even like those are dead typical. flowers in a house. It's like a, well, I think that we also think easy. of this as typical because it's such yeah. a familiar image that many yeah. of us have seen it. It just became so popular. It's in, it's in hotels, etc. Well, it may be my, it may be my reproduction. What words would you associate with this word, girls? Dark, dying. Dark, dying. Depressing, mm -hmm. ugly, sad. Death, isn't it? I mean, these sunflowers are at the height of their life, and the, of their life, and these sunflowers are are dying. But there is something in this that people are resonating that is even more. And not only that, there's something very powerful in that image. It's a stronger message than that because that's typical. That's not right. You don't generally think of sunflowers as associated with death, even the name of it. The point I wanted to bring out over here is that you can look at one thing and see it very differently. So you come to school and you think, oh, I'm at the greatest school in the whole world. This school is just the best school. And you have an argument with your friend. Oh, no one thinks that? <laughs> yeah, you do. I mean, I think that girls have positive, you have positive feelings about, um, about school. So, you come to school and you think it's a great school, and then something happens and you think it's a horrible school. Someone gives you a wonderful compliment, you think about yourself, I'm great. Someone criticizes you and you think, oh, they're horrible. I'm bad. <laughs> they're horrible. Either they're horrible or I'm horrible, right? Maybe very few of us would just say, well, maybe she's right and I need to work on something. There's an aspect of my personality that is flawed and let me try and, no, let me try and fix right. it. Can I say something personal? Yeah. Um, actually, you know, we have this thing in our school. Guys, you have it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So yesterday I said, oh my gosh, I'm so going to win this. I was having all the chocolate red zang attitude. And someone came over to me and said, I don't think you deserve it. I think someone else deserves it more. And at first I was like, oh my gosh, that's so mean. And then I thought, like, it's true. The only thing that I, whatever, I, I made my own cheshpan of what I actually gained it, and it wasn't a lot. Like, there's other people who really do deserve it more, and I could work on myself so much more. But so sometimes it does well, strike a chord. That is, yeah, I mean, I think that's well, pretty I high level. She meant the other, another person deserves it more. She meant it different way. Right, but I, I'm you saying what, it, I, at first I took a regular, but then I realized it's true. Okay, but that's not very common, Khan. What? That no, because usually people 
Right, usually you get mad at the person, like, I'm not like that. Because usually like, people criticize and I'm doing it out of laughter. Out of love, right? Out of love, right? right. They're right. doing it, oh, like, you're, you're such a bad, like, I don't know, whatever they're trying right. to call you. So you take it as that because... You take it as something you know. Right. right, if the criticism right. comes from love, we are much more likely to be able to to internalize it and, and take a lesson from it. Like a thought said, if it's like a visible truth, it's not just a person's opinion, it's something that's Objective. true and you just have to realize it. It's not like the person thinks, you know, you're very laid back and it's not good. Most of the channel challenges that we bump up against in life are because things are about perspective. It's not so objective as saying, well, you know, what color is this? This is black and this is white. It's not like that. So someone could say, well, what color is this, you know, and then you have a whole lot of different names, that, and that's even something that is outside and objective. So what we look at with these pictures of, with the, the paintings from Van Gogh, is that he looks at the same thing in different ways. But then we're going to look at two other pictures, if you turn over exercise four. This is two different people looking at chairs and painting them in very different ways. So I'm going to show you these pictures. All right, girls. It's just so here, different, like, happenings, like different types of houses. You could have a cottage, or you could have a, you know, Spanish. Well, or these or two or pictures, well, if you have a look, hi, Mushka, can you see? Uh, Mushki, just sit back a drop. <laughs> These two pictures were painted by two artists who lived in a house together for a certain period of time. This is done by Gauguin, and it's his chair that he painted. And this is Van Gogh, and it's his chair that he painted. Can you see them? Can you see them clearly? Huh? Shall I make it a little bit bigger? What I want you to comment on is the differences between these two paintings. So you can look in your drawing over here, or you can look at this, because these have colors. What kind of no differences do you notice? Looks like I'm just laying, Sounds like more like homey. It looks like this is the master and this is the slave? It looks more stiff back there. OK, these are two friends. They're both artists, and they, they rented a house together, and they were painting, and it was winter. In the summer, they used to go out and paint the landscape, but in the winter, it was too cold, so they stayed indoors, that and they still wanted like to paint. This looks more like a summer picture to you? Like yeah, the like a patio. It looks like it's on a patio. Really? I see vegetables over here at the back. Yeah, to me, it looks like it's, in a, like it's in a it's kitchen. Right it's so this is more real, and this is more jazzed up. Like no, what do you like mean? He's trying yeah. to create this drama. Yeah, like the guy reading and he left in his candle flower. Right, what do we have on the chair over here? There's a candle and I a book. It was knitting. And what is on the chair over here? Can't see it. This, is, this is a pipe. He's preparing. If you have a look, oh, it's not so clear over here, but he's preparing his pipe. Can and at the back over here, here, huh? Can you make the second picture? Yeah, let me try and do that. I'll show you, but you'll only be able to see one of them at a time like this. So here's parts of Gauguin's chair. And you can see the lamp. And look how he's got fabric on the chair and the carpet is painted. The wall is dark. Yeah, the wall seems it's to be painted or have watercolor. I don't know. Uh, watercolor on it. And this is Van Gogh's chair, right? So it's clearly not as intellectual. There isn't a book. There isn't a candle. There isn't the lamp on the wall. You've got a couple of vegetables in the back and a stone floor like and out. the wall and this, this pipe. And the, the wood is very plain wood. It hasn't been stained or glazed. Now, my question to you is, looking at both of these paintings... When you look at both of those paintings, what do you think it tells you about the artist? One, more one, more one was more realistic. One Let's more say the Gauguin reality. is the first one and the Van Gogh is the second. Van Gogh so is more like plain life, like just simple, a Van chair, a door. Okay, simple. more basic, yeah. almost like a peasant. Mm -hmm. Kind, just an kind of quality. Sorry, Mushki? Take a face value like a chair, a chair. 
Well, is it at face value? Because let's you come back to that question. You is never find a, a, like a candle left on the chair usually. Why? Why we're talking about the second? If you're part. done above, you'll if you're done above, you'll you leave your phone above a candle. I leave I leave my coffee I leave my coffee on a chair. Or if you're yeah. Careful careful with your um here. Okay, so what else do you say about these two different people? If you were thinking about these two Well you can look at them both ways, either one is more realistic than the other or or the first one is being more um, like spirited and adding color to this like Okay, so another way of looking at it is that the Gauguin is more spirited. We would think that he has more highest, he's more dramatic as a person than, than Van Gogh. The best of whatever it is. Where do you get that? He has more of a detailed huh? It's red. There's this lush carpet, there's a lamp Classy. on the wall, there's a candle on the chair, there are arms but to the chair. The same house. Just one's a picture, one's a okay, so I have a question for you. Well they chose to paint. If you paint. think how do you think the paintings would be if Van Gogh painted Gauguin's chair and Gauguin painted Van Gogh's chair? Well we don't know. Maybe they were just copying Maybe reality. The exact same. Just one would have or they did one would style. dress it up a little bit. Depends. Yeah. Well, maybe but that was the reality. Yeah, I, I agree with Razi. You see, I don't doubt that the chairs had a form that looks basically like those chairs looked. But what the artists were doing, and what any artist does, is in trying to find the essence of that object. You have to when you have to penetrate and penetrate till you find the interior essence of something that you're trying to paint, and then you bring it out and you put it on a canvas for other people to see. But in the process, inevitably, what do you do? You put something of yourself in that chair. That is a projection. So when you look at another person, you're not only looking at that person; you're looking at yourself on that person as well. When you're happy with yourself, then you see other people in a oh, good light. We're not light. looking at the chair, we're looking at the chair because Van Gogh put himself in Yes, there is a lens through which you are looking at the world. Right, so when you, you expect something, like you expect someone to say thank you, so when they don't, you get upset. If you didn't expect that, you wouldn't have that emotion. You wouldn't be upset. Say that again. Because you expect people, let's say, to put things away or expect people to say thank you. When they don't say thank you, you have a certain reaction. Right. But if you didn't expect that, nothing yeah, yeah. would have happened. Okay, so I think there's two things. You're bringing up another dimension. Let's say, Chaim Mushkut, when you get irritated, mm -hmm. right? Why are you upset? Because you have an expectation. You said, I have an expectation that people will follow through or not waste their time or pick things up from the floor when they see that someone else is busy, right? Mm -hmm. So our expectations of others land us in a state where we're very dissatisfied with life. Not that we shouldn't have expectations, they can be very healthy. It's good to expect of people because then you help them to rise up to the level of your expectation. But it's not good to attach your happiness to their doing what you want them to do. So you have to understand that everybody has their unique way and if we were all the same, we wouldn't know much of the world. Right. And I think that, you know, when I began, I said our differences create the beauty of this world. And yet it's those very differences that get us to be irritated and upset because why is everyone not like me? As much as I can intellectually subscribe to the fact that it's great that we all, um, everybody that we are all different, you. when it comes down to things, I want people to do things the way I want people to do it. Why are you setting the table or arranging the flowers or running the event or whatever it is in your way? It should be going the way I want it to go. So, Hanla, I think that that is part of what we're saying, part of, the, part of the truth. But another part of it is, what I see in you is really a function of how I see myself. The way Van Gogh experienced himself and the way Gauguin experienced himself led to their imprinting, placing themselves on the world in a particular kind of way. That's how they present it, but not necessarily, <coughs> like, I expect something of people, but that's not how I am, necessarily. It's usually the opposite. 
Yeah. Like if you expect someone to pick something up, and usually you you pick it up, so you get frustrated when they don't. Yes, but what I'm talking about is, let's say, you're you're feeling happy with yourself. You're likely to be much more forgiving of other people. <coughs> what do we say? Simcha pirates get it. That joy breaks boundaries. When you're in a happy mood, you're much more forgiving of other people. So when you're in a happy mood, you can walk into a room and say, this is such a beautiful room. And when you're in a bad mood, you walk into the same room and you don't see it as a beautiful room. Because you are projecting a part of yourself onto that reality. So now we're coming to the book, to the, to the title of this lesson, Where the Wild Things Are. <coughs> which actually addresses that sometimes when we are critical, when we are criticizing, that is a defense mechanism. I'll give you an example. Think of Lush and Horror Girls, when you speak negatively about someone. I'm going to give you a statistic, and I want you to explain the statistic to me. The more a person speaks Lush and Horror, the less capable they are in interpersonal dialogue. <clears throat> the more successful a person is, the more capable a person is at interpersonal relationships, the less lush and horror they speak. So Why would that be? Judge. The more a person is successful in getting on with other people, the more capable you are of getting on along with other people, the less lush and horror you speak. And the less capable you are of having a dialogue, working something out with a person, dealing with confrontation, the more lush and hurry you speak. Why? Because when people deal with other people, then they're less judging. They're more able to see. Because you, know, you realize there's more diversity in people. So part of it is a person who is easygoing or accepting of other people is not going to have so much to criticize. It doesn't have to do with your... But there's something else. Sorry? You don't think it would make it easier people. to get on with other people? Oh, yeah, actually, yeah, I think when you're so interpersonal, you have to have the capacity in yourself to be respectful of other people's opinions in order to even listen to them. So once you have that respect, I think that it takes away the idea of talking badly about them. Okay, so, so if Brad is saying, good. in order to get on with people, you have to have a basic respect for another person. And once you have that respect, you will honor their dignity and not violate them by speaking about them to other people. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, Chava. Um, um, if you, oh, if you have good skills with other people, then you'll be able to talk it out with them instead of telling it to other people. Right. You see, I think that is much more, all of these are truths. I think they're all part of it. But that's what I was driving at, at least, which is, if you can talk it out, if you know how to get on with someone, you'll have the dialogue. Because right, even if you understand, you might, you might still get upset at them at something, and if you don't have that ability, then it will never work out. Yeah, if yeah, you don't have that to ability to dialogue and to talk through this issue, then you're going to walk away from it. I mean, you, or, or you'll come to the interaction, and it's going to escalate into a fight. You so people, people who don't have that ability or don't have the courage to have a courageous conversation with another person where they're going to deal with what's upsetting them, what do they do with it? What do they do with that upset? Very difficult just to hold it inside of yourself. So what do they wrong. do? It kind of leaks out the back door and they come to someone else and it's yada, 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 yada. I'll tell you everything about her. Instead of dealing with the person that I need to deal with, I start talking to a third person about it because I'm actually too afraid to have the conversation with the initial person. Chava. Well, let's say you just don't like someone and, like, complain about her or how it went to someone else. You can't bring it up to her because what are you going to say? You're annoying, your personality bugs me because you're not hanging out with me. Like, <laughs> you know, like, you can't say anything. What are you supposed to do? Well, so generally, the generally people about. aren't friends with people who bug them, right? So let's say it just happens to so it That she's part of your social I'm circle, this person really is part of your social I mean, circle. Yeah, yeah. So what do you things. think the appropriate I'm response is when things. someone bothers you? I just ignore her and never speak to her. But it's kind of weird because we sit at lunch together and stuff. 
But no, like, like, seriously, yeah. like, what am I supposed to do? I always talk about her. She's so annoying, but like... <laughs> Okay, so let's have a look. Let's have a look. What are you supposed to do when you have these negative feelings about someone and you don't know what to do with it? Yeah, to go and speak to someone else, you can't. You and to realize. say something to her, maybe that's going to be hurtful or what is it going to accomplish? So what do you actually do with those feelings that you have inside of you? So what we're going to be looking at is how criticism can function as a defense mechanism. When I start criticizing you very much, it's really about the fact that there's something inside of me that I don't want to look at. It could be I don't want to deal with this dialogue, I don't want to have this conversation with this person, and therefore I start criticizing her to someone else. Or it could be inside of me there's something that I am critical of, I don't want to deal with it, and therefore what do I do? I start, I start turning my own anger or upset at myself outwards onto other people. Yeah. Much like Van Gogh and Gauguin put their own inner world onto the painting, but just onto those two chairs. Person, it's not because you have the same problem. No, but you're just yeah, gearing yeah. your attention elsewhere. But let's even okay. deal with your problem right so, now. Because you don't want to deal with yeah. certain yeah. issues. Okay, okay. I want to say two things. Khalila, it, it, it is not uh, the case. You're right. It's, you, you don't always have the problem inside of you. When someone, maybe you could be the opposite, right. But one thing is certain, wherever you are in life, if, if, you have, if you are feeling things that are an, antithetical to what Hashem wants for us, that means He is giving you on a silver platter an invitation, here's something for you to work on. Otherwise, it wouldn't come your way. Okay, because he wants you to reveal a koyach, an ability inside of yourself that you don't even know you have. You have to look at every negative thought that you have, every critical thought, every challenging interaction as an opportunity to grow. As humans, we're all different. And you, you won't get anywhere in the world if you can't respect anyone else but yourself. If you can't respect, right, you have to be able to. Right. You have to be able. Be like you know, you might be very different than me, but right. we get along because we're humans. Right. Okay, so let's have a look. Razi, you want to read? Sure. Text one. Yeah. His mother called him wild thing, and Max said, "I'll eat you up." So he was sent to bed without eating anything. <laughs> Okay, so what do you think happened over here? Why did Maxell eat you up? She called him a wild thing. Yeah, why do you think she called him a wild thing? Because he, he probably was a wild thing, right? He was behaving wildly. But then what does... Huh? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to tell you what the... What happens in where the wild things are, you're going to see something soon. What happens in where the wild things are is as follows. Max is misbehaving or he's behaving wildly and his mother says you wild thing and he says I'll eat you up is and she says to, to him her? he was talking to her yeah. so she says to him you're going to go to bed without eating and he goes to his room and in his room his bed turns into a forest the wooden posts of the bed become trees and it's a forest and all of a sudden he sails away over the ocean in his imagination to a foreign island and there are the wild things there are these creatures and he begins to take on the movements first he's scared of them and then he becomes fr friendly with them he befriends these wild creatures until eventually he masters his connection with the wild things and he comes home and uh, there his mother has put supper for him in the bedroom and all of the forests and the wild world that he's been imagining disappears and there he is in his bedroom so the book the book is about a child who is too he's scared he's so angry with his mom and he's scared to be so angry with his mom. It's a scary feeling to feel like, I'll eat you up to your own mother. Well, she called and then his thing. imagination takes him away so that he can deal with his own wildness, his own feelings about himself until he settles down and he comes back to his bedroom. So I, I saw on the internet when I was researching a very interesting interview with Morris Sendak, who's a, 
uh, a Jewish guy, very clever, uh, deep and sensitive person. And the interviewer said to him, are you Max? Were you, is that your childhood that you were writing about? And this is what he writes. Um, I did use my childhood in a crucial, essential way, of course, but in a literal, factual way, not at all. I'm nothing like Max is. I was never as brave as that. I got yelled at, but not because I was brave. So he's not me. What is there, of course, is the very complicated relationship of a child and a mother, and Papa isn't home. The title, of course, is a comic translation of the Yiddish phrase which mothers scream at their children when they're beasts and are totally uncontrollable. So the title came from something my mother would have said to me, and frequently did, I'm sure. What does it mean, the title came from a Bilde comic Chaya. translation of a Yiddish Chaya. phrase, Bilde Chaya, right, the best-selling children's book of all time, so comes Jewish. from the expression Bilde Chaya. Yeah, yeah. Morris, he's a Jewish guy. But what the book, what we're talking about is this notion of I see sunflowers and I see them as light and I see them as dark. I see them as life and I see them as death. I see a chair and two people are looking at the same chair, see them completely differently. I look at the world and I see it in very different ways, largely determined by what is happening inside of me. So what we're going to do now is go through text number three, which we'll read aloud together. And then we're going to do text 3A, 3B and 3C. And there are a couple of questions for you to answer, which you'll do in Chivrosa. Okay. Dava. No, a master of the soil secreted himself for planting the vineyard before anything else. He drank of the wine, became drunk, and uncovered himself in his tent. From the father of Canaan, looked at his father's nakedness. He related the incident to his two brothers. Shame and Yathis took a garment and placed it on both of their shoulders. They walked backwards and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned backwards so that they did not see their father's nakedness. Noah awoke from this wine and realized that his father was having been there. Okay, so there's a number of different things here. Language that is significant. What happened is that Noah has come out from the Teva and he drinks and his children relate to him. Shem, Cham, and Yathis relate to him in very different ways. How does Cham relate to him? He laughed at him. He looked, what does it say? He related. Uh, firstly, he looked at his father's nakedness, and secondly, he related the incident to his brothers. And Shem and Yathis, what did they do? They didn't look and they covered. They didn't look and they covered, they brought healing. But how do you know what Cham did? He was sleeping. How did who know what How did Nayak know that Ham had looked at him and had laughed and whatever and told his father? Well, <coughs> there was, depending on what, which Mephorshim you read and what had actually happened, he could see that there was evidence on his body that something had happened. But <coughs> what I find is more interesting in your question is how did he know that it was Ham? Immediately he woke up. It says he knew, he realized what his smallest son had done to him, and it doesn't he say knew their personalities. he knew their personalities, right? Okay. This is someone. Which kid did which? Yeah. Who stole the cookies, and who? Still doing their homework. Who's still doing their homework, right? Okay, so a parent has a sense of the different personality that belongs to each child. And it doesn't say his youngest son, it says his smallest son. So let's look at text 3B. Whom are There's we up to like cover? Smallest, what, Rosie? And like values. Very good. Oh, that's A lovely insight. She says his smallest, it's yes, small. because in terms of values or stature, he was smaller than his was brothers. <coughs> Yeah, he was the oldest, and she was the oldest. I thought it was and then Cham. No, Yathas was the oldest, and Cham was the oldest. Really? 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 I thought Shame was the oldest. No, I thought Shame was the oldest. Shame was the greatest. Alright. But that's so cool that he's the smallest, and he's not the youngest. So it's not speaking about his youngest son, it's speaking about his smallest son. Okay, Chava. Okay, so that's what Noyak realized. He realized that his son had gone and spoken Lashon Hara about whatever had happened. He went and gossiped. Next, 
let's contrast what Ham did with what Shem and Yafis did. Uh, Esli. I mean, Chaimushka. Okay. Sharing Yafis talk, why, why is this said a second time? To teach that as they approached him and they needed to turn toward him to cover him, they still kept their faces toward him. Okay, so what... What Rashi is telling us over here is that you have it mentioned once and then it's mentioned a second time. The second time is to tell us not only that they were taking the cloth in order to cover their father, but that they kept their heads turned away they as they... Because it says that you have to constantly tell yourself they, that you shouldn't be saying this or... They turned away you know, and they didn't keep see. away from it because it's a constant... Um, I don't know why it's under there. Something that people want to do constantly... And as you're like, oh, oh I'm not going to say because I don't know. No, I really want to hear it. And, you know, you have to constantly keep Right, that there's, if Rat is saying that, that a person has to constantly be involved in resisting and moving away from the Lush and horror that is presenting itself to you, that you have to turn your face. Han, you had a... Uh, a question about the the no, I don't have it in I don't have it in the English. I just have Vayikach Shem Vayafis is her similar. They took the garment for Yesumal Shchem Shnehem. They both put it on 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 Shchem, and they went in backwards, and they covered his nakedness, the nakedness of their of their father, and their faces were. Turned backwards, so that's really on that by you're not seeing the whole, um, the whole thing. But it's really, it's really on this notion that they went in backwards and then their faces kept on being turned backwards. Okay, what I want you to do is to turn to chart one and discuss it for a moment. Sit with a partner, um, you, you two and you two. <coughs> you can do you three and you two. Read these. Uh, it says what happened with a question on it and then things to think about and a question on it and I'm going to have you give me feedback in a minute, okay? So the first one, what happened? Ham looked at his father's nakedness. What's the difference between looking and seeing? Looking, is, looking is focusing on it. Right. I would say that there's the notion of intention, yeah. That, that when you... Seeing is... Is kind of yeah, uh, yeah. you happen to see. Oh, I saw that. But looking, looking is I am gazing at that and I am focusing on that. So, what is the significance of of uh, Ham uh, looking? He purposely did it. He wanted to look at it. It wasn't like he passed by and saw. It's like he intentionally. Saw. Right. Either he was going looking. Or he stumbled across something, and then what does he do? Yeah. He doesn't stop. Right. He just keeps on looking. It's like if you're on the computer and there's some kind of pop-up that comes on the screen. You weren't looking for that pop-up. It, kind of, it just came your way. But then your, your choice is just click, close it down. Okay, okay. I'm not so clicking through. And you know it's wrong. Like you find it says, um, and you keep no. doing it. Okay. Keep right, it. right. So a person right. could... A person could be uh, oh. engaged in something that is inappropriate, get that it's inappropriate and ignore that, or make a decision that they're actually going to change. A person who has been stripped of their protective facade could be described as naked. When you see someone's weakness exposed, what is your response? Do you understand what I mean by stripped of their protective yeah. facade? Well, yeah. if someone's judge. pretending, someone's wearing a mask, and they use that as their own protective mechanism, and all of a sudden someone says something or something happens, and they trip up and their mask is exposed. If you judge so what that do you weakness, do? then you'll judge the person. But if you don't judge that weakness, then you won't judge the person. You can either cover them and help them recover. Them. Well, it depends on the area. Actually. Yeah, but my question is more: What is your personal response? So like the the guys, guys, what I, I think it depends a lot on like how how the person is. Like an example, like kids a lot of times. Let's say they lie straight out. Protective facade lying. You know, they lie, and then you realize that they lie, and you're like, what? And then either if the kid's all embarrassed and like face gets red and like all sad, then you are feel bad for him, and you're like yeah. you covered up right, because you they believe him. But if, like, he's like, no, -uh, I was, I wouldn't have lied. And I'm like, hey, yes, it was. And then you want to prove it to him. 
a lot of times people react defensively, and then you just prove them more. And sometimes you're like, you're so, right that's so because you don't like but the defense that he's putting on, so you'll right. counteract that. No, so if you judge, yeah, but that if you listen to what you're saying, Chava, right? What so what you're saying is when someone is defending and denying, I'm going to push you all the right. way <laughs> and make you do it. When you're embarrassed, then I say, oh, you know, I'll just pretend that I didn't hear that and right. go along with your lie. Depends. Different people. Because the kid knows he did wrong. Different situations. Depends on, the, depends on the reaction of the person. It could be the same. It could be the same girl. Just one time she gets defensive. One time she doesn't get defensive. If she gets defensive. I'm gonna push it. If she doesn't get defensive, I'm gonna cover it up. Right? You know. Like, right. That you want the person to have the realization yeah. that what they've done yeah. is something that is something that is wrong. Right, look, we all have a choice. We all have a choice when we see someone exposed to look or not to look. You know, often uh, you see people are in a room and someone says something that's embarrassing. Why is it and then busy? some people, one second, some people look across at their friend and giggle or smile. And some people, they just don't want to engage in that. They just keep their eyes down. Well, They're so not, not even to visually. Person, right, in order not to, in order not to embarrass that person. You don't look. You saw something and you turn your eyes away like shame in the office. I that was the last one, yeah. You turn your eyes away so that you don't engage with them. Why do you think Ham was prompted by what he saw to speak to his brothers? Because he judged the nakedness of his father. He didn't have enough self like worth to not. He didn't know how to interact with people. Whether that's his father. Isn't that what we said before? <laughs> that when you are bad at interacting with people, you talk about them? Well, uh, who was... Yeah, frankly, talk about an unkind person. Talk about good. It was I'm an, an uncomfortable well. situation. No, talk about something. like a baby, like... Well, you do nothing, yeah, yeah, I'm okay, one, on you. one second. Here's one opinion it's that it was an uncomfortable right. situation. He's immature, fine, but he judged the nakedness. That's why he talked about it. If, to him, it was normal. He wanted to talk about it. Like when you see someone doing something that's totally normal to eating a sandwich, you want to go talk about it. But when you see someone jumping <laughs> off, off the bridge, you're going to go talk about it. Because yeah, it's yeah, different. It's so, something it's that, so corrupted because who are you to decide what's... Well, it's your personal opinion. Obviously, like, you could work on um, it, but that's... Have you ever seen people like, jumping off bridges? No, I know, but I mean, like, yeah. I disagree with, like, what, um, I think Paul was saying that, um, you said that when they, de when they become defensive, I mean, like, who are you to decide whether their defense mechanism is good or bad? No, what she's saying is that you can see in a person when there's been a recognition of a mistake. And therefore, you should be the one to explain it. Yeah, that's why I said, you know, like, oh, here, when someone's being defensive, you're pushing them to admit the truth, and when someone admits they the truth, they know they're wrong, so you, why you, no. you yeah, oh, make them feel worse? I, I only, like, necessarily agree with the theory, like, with the ideal of it, but it's true, and somebody doing something so wrong, you want to let them, you but if they're them conscious to admit that they're doing something wrong. How do you know they're conscious, though? You see, no, one of the things, being, if they get all defensive, that means that they're conscious of doing something wrong. Then you think it's a bit that means that they're not like Yes, I think that Dubba is saying they're something not like they're very significant. If the friend of yours, then right. you want really It depends the who the person is. Where are you going to take it? It has to be what? coming from love. It has to be coming. It has to be coming in the context of a relationship where there is closeness. Where there is closeness. I think my friends are to get egotistical to say like. Mm -hmm. You, you should yeah, figure this out because you're wrong and I'm right. Yes, I don't think that if it's coming because I am just being judgmental and telling you how to fix your life, you're not necessarily going to listen. But if it's coming from a place of real caring, then the person is going to be more receptive. And that's something that we can look at, uh, that we'll look at next week. But I do think that when we look at Ham, that in his nature, even Ham is Hamimus, the heat. He has inside of himself something that makes him look at his father in a particular way. He is noticing in him what he has inside of himself. And that's what it says over here. What inside of you causes you to talk about others' weaknesses and mistakes? Is it the same force or reasoning that gets you to talk about how someone wronged you? What did you say there? Yeah. Right. It is, right? It's that, that, that sense is that if I have it inside of myself, this is what I'm going to speak about in someone else. So, Mushki, please read text number four. If one sees any evil in his friends, it is as if one were looking into a mirror. If one's face is dirty, one sees a dirty face. If one's face is clean, one sees nothing bad in the mirror. 
you're finding it in someone else, you it's either because you have it in you or you're like the opposite of that person. Like it's like so wrong to you. That's why so you're noticing it. Yeah. It's like exactly. what they say or not. Someone's a really naturally kind person. It'll hurt them. Someone's being rude and nasty and mean. They are not. No, but it could be that deep down they're really rude and nasty person. But no. I want to point out it's something like that it says. Uh, you know what you're saying it's reminds me of chapter ten of Tanya. In chapter ten of Tanya, the Alter Rebbe is speaking about what is the difference between a perfect tzaddik, a complete tzaddik, and an incomplete tzaddik, right? And he, and one of the ways that you can see the difference is the degree to which the complete tzaddik fights evil in the world. Why? Because he has no evil inside of him. And being that he has no evil inside because of him, he, loves, he, so he loves Hashem so much and he, he cannot tolerate him. evil, so that becomes his war. Not to say that he's coming and bashing down people who are involved in things they shouldn't be. So he's coming with love well, to help them yeah. out of that situation. But when you have a little bit of evil, it's almost like the opposite of what we're saying, but I think that we can reconcile it. When you have some evil inside of you, you can tolerate it in someone else. Let's say you yeah, speak Lash and Hara. So then you'll be able to hang around people who speak negatively about others. Right, so it's if not it's, a mirror. If I have that flaw, I won't think the other person is bad. I think if it's I a, see it, it is No, but you might not want to face to that flaw. If I talk Lash and Hara and I see you speak Lash and you speak Lash and I won't think it's bad. No, but I you might think that it's, it's, you almost, it's so you horrible because you, you just don't want to admit that you have that flaw. Yeah, what Hannah is saying is true. It is like a little bit of an opposite. Yeah. There is an aspect where this is opposite. Because I have it in me, I can tolerate it in you, right? Well, I don't know if you but how does that fit with this notion? I'm coming to you now, Chava. Yeah. How does that fit with the notion that what I see in another person, I have in myself? I want to give you an example in the positive. When you see something good in another person, girls, you have to know you have that inside of yourself. If you see someone who is kind, it goes both ways. It's not just saying what if you see, see someone, well, you know, no, no, being you lazy, if we come back to our original, you wouldn't be able to recognize it. You wouldn't be able mm -hmm. to name it if you didn't have that thing inside of yourself. Somewhere there is no, an aspect of that inside of you. Well, it'll be small. Sense, you can't I know. He's extra generous. I'm not extra generous, but he is. Yeah, yes, you but you have some generosity you. inside Everyone. of you. What if someone no, like Sarah? Yeah, I could be a very stingy person. But you'd have. It's like you can't. Maybe it's not. You can't teach another one. You can't, you can't teach another one. Yeah, well, maybe like you have to be able to recognize it within yourself. Well, certain things you know in your mind, but it's not in your heart. It's not in your actions. Certain things you know in your head. Where do you know it from? The world. I don't know. No, I think that what you're saying is uh, is is uh, very relevant. I have to think about it. You see, there, there are different ways of looking at it. One is to say, if I have it in me, I can tolerate it in another person. If I see something in another person... Not necessarily is that in you. So the Ma'er and I is saying, we're going to look at when it applies and when it doesn't, okay? I'm going to make, I want to hear what Chava has to say, and I want to yeah, look at, at when, at two different applications of this Chava. I think it has to do with, like, more, like, what's nature and nurture or something, like, or just, like, what, what's natural for you and what you have to kind of work on, like, let's say, like, I'm just naturally generous, so stingy people don't bother me, like, I don't care, okay, you're not generous, that's fine, not everyone's there, but, um... Like, let's say something I'm less comfortable. I don't, I don't know. I think it's something that, like, you still are a little bit... Something that you're on. struggling with. Not even struggling with. It's just that something that, like, you really or like you really feel for so strongly. Let's say, like, you hate lazy people because you hate being lazy yourself. You don't like when you're lazy and you make sure you're never lazy. But that one time you're going to be lazy, oh, yeah, in one to ten sense. years, you're going to get... You're going to be like, oh, I wasted my time. I'm so yeah. mad. Blah, blah, blah. So the mirror thing makes sense. So if you experience it, you do everything. Yourself, you know, to make sure but you just made the mirror thing make yeah. sense. If you experience like a little bit of laziness in yourself, not a lot. Not a lot of it, then, you, then you're fine with the other right? person. So the right. negative right. feeling right. has because been having that experience. Right, because it bothers you so much. So I hate lazy people because I remember how it feels to be lazy. But if you're always lazy, then you're going to be fine. Okay, girl, so I want to focus because we're going to. She's done a really smart point. What clarified it for you? You have to have had an experience of that. I'm not a lazy person, right, let's say. But I 
remember what it feels like to be lazy, and I hate that. So when I see it in someone else, I'm going to hate it more. It doesn't mean that I have to actually have it, but it's not necessarily a mirror of who I am now, but it's a mirror of everything, like my nature. You see, what I think binds what everyone is saying together is that the way I relate to the world outside of me is not just a factor of the world outside of me. It has something to do with my own inner landscape. So let's take this example of what the Maori Naim is saying. You could see something in someone else, but you have two very different responses. One response is, I become angry or irritable around this attribute. The other is, I am moved to action, I want to, I want to help. When we look at Noach and his sons, Ham was judging it. There was negativity in that interaction. When we look at Shem and Yafes, there was some positive response. When do you really have it inside of you? If it's something that angers and irritates you, that's what we're talking about over here. That means you have something to work on in this aspect because you have become irritable about it. So the Rebbe says over here that... Um, in the Sikha that this class is based on, the Rebbe says that if you become angry, that is a vi like a litmus test. That is an indicator when you become angry that, is, that this has something to do with your own personal avoda. It's something for you to work on. Whereas if you have the shame and yafis response, this is really about what I you angry. can give. I mean, like I think a lot of us get annoyed. And yes, I'm annoyed or indignant. Angry. Yeah, annoyed. I have negative feelings. I am judging the other person. I think annoyance is actually a little bit angry. Like you're angry at that person for not. Yeah, but you're not like, like yes, like, it is. So like, I, like for instance, I get very frustrated when people misuse like certain words or something like that. But I don't get angry at that. Oh, that's different. I don't. Okay, so if it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be mild. I mean, let's say someone is a grammatician and doesn't like the way people use language today. Okay, right. And it's not necessarily there when you're speaking about this mild irritation. That's not what we're talking about. We're speaking about having this kind of instinctive emotional reaction that is against and judging the other person and putting them down. As opposed to, I don't like this entity and it would be nice if we could educate people not to use the word handicapped or retarded or, or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, Chava. Um, I think that like, it's impossible to say that you don't have that trait at all at all. You obviously have it some aspect. You know, you can't say that you've never, ever, ever in your life transgressed other people's privacy. And maybe like after you do that, you were like, so embarrassed, why don't you do that? And you're beating yourself up about it because you really hate that. So, like, you can hate it in yourself and hate another person too. You know, like, you have yeah. people all of a sudden jump to say, no, I'm not like that. I'm exactly the opposite. We never said you're exactly like that. We said that the few times that you do do it really bother you. And obviously, you can't mm -hmm. have some of it because you can't have nothing. Yeah, one of, the, one of the keys to remember is that there's a big range. Things are subtle. And it could be that I have a little bit of that in me or a lot of that in me and that's going to impact the degree to which I'm irritated. So I think that what we really want to focus on here is not about being bad and not even about another person being good, but what does that indicate in me for my Avedas Hashem? How can I grow from my interactions? When I look at the world as a mirror, how can I use that to grow and become a better person? Um, you know, there's that story about the Yid who came to the Rebbe, to a Rebbe, I don't remember which, and he said, wherever I go in the shul, people are stepping on me. So the Rebbe said to him, why do you spread yourself all over the shul so that no matter where people go, they can't help but step on you? You know, I could take my ego, my yesh, and spread myself all over the world, and you will have nothing to do but to step on me because wherever you go you can tread here and you can tread there but I'm so big my ego is so big that you're going to be I will experience you as violating me and then I can work on better you realize that you don't have the ego right and when I do I have to work on nullifying that ego and once I nullify that ego 
there's much more space for me to be able to interact with others. So I want you girls to go in, back into your groups just for fun as we close. There's an exercise here. It's called the Game of Conjugation. And what it shows is that when we speak about ourselves, or we speak about a person that we are talking to, second person, or a third person, we describe things in different ways. So have a look over here. I am firm. You are stubborn. He's an obstinate mule. You see the difference? Mm-hmm. When I speak about the, I, uh, me, it's positive. Friendly. You, it's kind of neutral. He or she, oh well, you know, terrible. I am a liberal. You are a radical. He's a communist. I am far-seeing. You are a visionary. He's a fuzzy-minded dreamer. So I want to see if you and your pairs can come up with at least one of these, hopefully two or three, all right? Let's see what you come up with. Speaking about how we look at ourselves, we judge ourselves favorably, and we judge other people uh, negatively. Let's do it all together. We'll start with something. Let's say, I am funny. You're a clown. You're a clown. She is? Stupid. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Funny, silly. You are? I am funny. I'm funny. You are silly. She is immature. Right. Well, maybe we can find their representative on that. Something else. Let's go with I am. You're a clown. I am intellectual. You are so less a ready. And she's up to You're a geek. She's a geek. Yeah, yeah. The last one would be would, would, would be she's a geek, right? Or she's a nerd. I, I'm intellectual. Well, you're a bookworm. You're a bookworm. I'm intellectual. You're a bookworm. She's a geek. <laughs> Anyone can come up with something else? I'm stylish. Okay, I'm stylish. And she follows. She she's a fashion she slave. Goes to the yeah. Yeah. She has no style. She doesn't have her own style. I'm blunt. She, no, that's like totally alienated. I'm blunt. He, you are rude. He's a <laughs> uh, Okay, so yeah, good. I uh, know. I would put. I'm straightforward, I'm straightforward yeah. right? Or I'm honest. You are blunt. And she is. Despicable. <laughs> Despicable. <laughs> Well, she is rude. Yeah, she is rude. That kind of thing. I think that's the most common like thing. Like you, like you could say someone's honest. You could say they're they're really blunt or or, right. Like someone's like, oh, I'm just a blunt person, person, but you think they're disgusting because they came over to you and told you like your shoes are disgusting. Like there's a difference between being honest. I'm honest. When I say it, I'm just being honest. I'm being real with you. But when you say it to me, it's like, how could you do such a thing, right? You're convincing them um, and you that you're saying, you know, whatever you're saying is fine because you're totally being honest. Right. So I want you girls to go away this week and to think about this notion that uh, we're looking at the same world and what we see depends on who we are and taking that further, that if I see something negative in someone else, let me check in. If I get angry, let me check in. So now when you go back to your original exercise and you look at what you wrote, what you can do for this week is to say to yourself, how much of that is because I have a vestige, even a tiny little bit of it inside of myself, and how much of it is coming when I feel that kind of thing? Do I have a response where I want to actually help someone? Am I having a ham kind of response or am I having a shame in the office kind of response? And to become sensitive to the language that we use. What kind of adjectives am I using to describe myself and you and someone else? Okay. Thank you.